All right, are all board members present? We have about one minute till we begin. I see Trustee Philbeck, Board Clerk Alvarez, Trustee Ruelas. Trustee Lopez, are you here? Yes, I am, thank you. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July 22, 2020 Anaheim Elementary School District Board of Trustees meeting. My name is Paulo McAllis, and I am the board president, and I call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may, co you may connect by phone as follows, by calling 559-556-0895. When asked, type in the PIN 571-616-746, followed by the pound sign. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 510-766-2131. Cuando se le pida, presione el pin 631-665. Cuatro, cuatro, siete, ocho, y el simbolo pound. Board members, tonight all voting will be by roll call vote. When motioning or seconding an item, please state your name. For any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the items. Thank you. So let's go ahead and begin with the flag salute. Elsa, can you put up the flag? Wonderful, thank you. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and begin with our introductions and roll call. First up, we have board member Ryan A. Ruelas. Present. Followed by trustee Jackie Philbeck. Present, hello everyone. Followed by board member Mark A. Lopez. Followed by our board clerk, Juan G. Alvarez. Present. Present. I'm also present. present at the moment. And we also have our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Followed by our assistant superintendent of Ed services, Dr. Mary Grace. Good evening. Followed by our assistant superintendent of human resources, Dina Milland. Hi, everybody. We also have our assistant superintendent of administrative services, Michael Krause. Good evening, everyone. Followed by a Director of Communications and Public Information, Elsa Covarrubias. Good evening, everyone. Followed by our Senior Administrative Assistant, Iris Camacho. Hello, everybody. We also have Mary Madrigal and Alina Rogue, our interpreters. And last, but definitely never least, Janice Cato and Darren Brown are technology assistants. All right, moving on to report Hello. of closing. <laughs> hey, Janice, welcome. 
Thank you. All right, moving on to 3C, report of closed session, actions taken. There are none. So let's go with the adoption of the agenda. Now, before we do that, uh, consent calendar item 8B.3, funding description of Title IV Part A, reflects to be transferred into title and has been amended to read to be transferred into Title II Part A. Do I hear a motion to adop, adopt the agenda as amended? So moved. Ruelas. So Second, by Alvarez. Trustee Ruelas, seconded by Trustee Alvarez. Discussion? Hearing none, let's go ahead and do our roll call vote. <coughs> Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. And our board clerk, Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye, passes 5-0. Moving on to special order of business, there are none. <clears throat> Next is our news and updates. 5A, parent leadership group updates. There are no parent leadership group updates for tonight. Moving on to association updates. There are also no association updates for tonight. There is, however, 5C, district news and updates. <coughs> Pope Rubius, our Director of Communications and Public Information. Thank you, Board President Macalas. We have just a few updates. Um, meals distributed, a total of 235,906 meals were distributed at our 23 school sites in the last two weeks since the last board meeting. Meals will continue to be provided through the Seamless Summer Program until the start of the school year. Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. We continue to promote the Anaheim Elementary Online Academy in the community as a safe and engaging option for families who wish to have their children continue in a 100% distance learning format. Start of 2020-21 school year. As staff begins to return to school sites and prepare for the new school year, they are being trained on safety protocols for themselves and in preparation for the day that blended learning is permissible, which will bring students back to school sites. Staff is also preparing a series of videos to teach students about the new safety protocols and good health hygiene practices, which will be implemented when students return to schools. We also want to take a moment to welcome Iris Camacho. We would like to formally welcome her and introduce Iris Camacho as the communications and public information um, newest team member. Iris joins us as the new Senior Administrative Assistant and is the lead on organizing board meetings. She comes to us after having worked for the district at school sites, in pupil services, and most recently in human resources. We are really excited to have her on our team. Additionally, we would like to thank Annalie Williams, Senior, Senior Administrative Assistant 2, who has been working with us um, in assisting with the board meetings during this transition as well. Thank you, Anna. That concludes this um, board meetings, board um, news and updates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elsa, and welcome, Iris. All right, let's go ahead and move on to public speakers. Speakers on agenda or non-agenda items. For tonight, there are no public speakers. Let's go ahead and move on to item seven, superintendent's report and public hearings. Presentations will be posted on the district website. Board of Education page tomorrow. So with that said, the board, the board president is requested to declare a public hearing for the purpose of hearing comments regarding whether pupils in the schools will have during the 2020-2021 school year sufficient textbooks and or instructional materials consistent with the content and cycles of the curriculum frameworks adopted by the California Department of Education. Ed code 60119 and 33126. Written comments up to 500 words may be submitted and must be received by 12 p.m. on Wednesday, July 22, 2020. Comments submitted will be read aloud by the board president or designee. 
After hearing comments from the public, the board president will give notice that a vote on this item is scheduled for the August 19th, 2020 regular board meeting. And there are also no uh, comments for this item. So let's move on to B, presentation of revised 2020-2021 budget, proposed budget by Michael Krause, our Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services. Yes, good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Downing and Cabinet, members of the community, and everyone that is online with us this evening. So bear with me for a moment as I present my screen. I'm going to present the um, presentation. Should be loading now. Is everyone able to see the presentation? Yes, Michael. Okay, great, thank you. So again this evening, I am bringing forward the revised 2021 budget. And just to give you a little bit of background, you may recall the governors may revise proposed drastic cuts to the state budget and to district budgets. However, when the final budget was signed, uh, there was uh, rescinding a lot of the cuts that were in, in the May revise. And so what districts have the opportunity to do is then come back, revise their budget for 2021 based on what was actually signed into law by the governor. So this evening, I will just talk to you briefly about the changes that were taking place. And then to let you know that you may be receiving an additional budget update come September with the unaudited actuals because the federal government is still working on the HEROES Act where they are proposing funding to backfill a lot of education. And just today, they decided they would not be able to pass anything in the month of July. So it will be moved to potentially early August before uh, the state of California and the United States would know about the HEROES Act and what will be in there as far as potential backfilling of funding for the state of California and school districts. So just as we move forward, uh, just something to keep in mind. So moving on to the first slide, here we see the budget assumptions, and this is very similar to what you saw when I presented at the last uh, board meeting, the budget. The only thing that has changed is that in the upper left, you will see on the revenues, the LCFF funding, there are no reductions in LCFF funding. However, there is no increase of COLA of 2.31%. So all districts, including ours, received no reductions in the funding formula itself and in funding, but again, we did not receive the 2.31% COLA, the cost of living adjustment. So basically we are taking a cut in state revenues because that was in the proposed budget back in January, you may recall. So we're hoping in the future, depending on the revenues, that the COLA will be reinstituted at some point and give districts that additional amount of money for the cost of living that districts are used to getting. I will tell you that the tax revenues came out. You may recall the tax deadline was uh, moved to July and that the tax revenues in the state of California did exceed the budgeted estimations even with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So that is a little bit of good news on the tax revenues coming into the state. We don't know how long that will last, but it will uh, hopefully be something of a, a good sign as we move forward looking at revenues in the state. So all of the other uh, items here under revenues stay the same and all of the other items on the expenditures you can see here on this slide, uh, this is the exact same verbiage because the biggest change again was that LCFF funding once the governor signed the budget in July. So looking at the revenues now, you can see here, and I put a little asterisk by the LCFF sources because that's the change where you can see there that the uh, 184 million now is our projected revenue coming in from the state. And that's the change since the uh, adopted budget uh, that was presented last time. So that's the change and it's a lot more than what we had anticipated. And so we're uh, excited to know that the governor and the legislature came to an agreement on not having such a huge funding cut for school districts, including ours. So we uh, incorporated that into our budget. 
And again, as we move forward, any other uh, revenue sources that may or may not come in, we will update this at unaudited actuals in September. But as you can see, the total revenue now is projected to be 223 million. And so as we move forward, that's the biggest change that we see in this budget presentation. Uh, looking at uh, the next slide, moving to the next slide, we see our expenditure summary. So here you can see uh, the expenditures very similar to what we looked at at the last um, budget presentation. And all of these categories are the main categories of an operating budget of a school district, including ours. So, and you can see the top three again are always salaries and benefits that uh, take up the majority of our expenditures in our district, as well as many districts in the state of California. So that's the bulk of where the expenditures come from uh, for us. And you can see there our total expenditures are a little over 223 million uh, there as well. So moving to the next slide now, we also again present a multi-year projection. So anytime we do a budget change or a budget update, such as this is a revised budget, we still have to report the multi-year projections and what that will do because the revenues coming in in this year will affect the multi-year projections. So again, we do the current year 2021 and then the two out years. So looking at the next slide, here are our multi-year projections based on our revenues that we anticipate coming in now with the updated LCFF calculator and our expenditures for 2021. And then you can see uh, deficit spending in red. So the red there shows a deficit spending of about $201,000. Now, what that does is that moves over to the next year. So then we look at our expected revenues based on the uh, current calculator. And then we look at our expenditures and then we have a surplus there in 2021. And you'll see how this affects our ending fund balance in a, in a, in a few slides from now. And then in 22, 23, you can see our revenues and then our expenditures where we're deficit spending there, as you can see there. So one of the things that the out year 22, 23 is always the most unpredictable and unknown, because again, we know that many things will change based on what happens in September with the federal government, based on uh, state tax revenues. So at first interim in December, we might have a better idea of how the out years will be affected by the revenues that potentially will or will not come in. So then this next slide talks about the projected ending fund balance. And so here you can see the beginning fund balance in 2021 and then the ending fund balance. And again, that ending fund balance just carries over to the next year. And then after we uh, take into account our expenditures and our revenues, it then carries over to the third year, 22, 23, and our ending fund balance in that third year out is, a, is predicted to be about 38.5 million. So this just shows you our projected ending fund balances. Again, this is in anticipation of the federal funding coming in in September as well as the uh, current calculations based on the governor's signed budget in July. So as we move forward, these numbers will change because this is a living document. And we know that as we identify additional expenditures, as we move forward, uh, they will also come off of that ending fund balance. So one of the big discussions also that uh, you may have heard about in the governor's signed budget are cash deferrals. And what that means is that every district receives a certain amount of cash uh, every month throughout the year to pay their bills. However, if the state defers cash to districts, districts have to find other ways to pay, make payroll. So for example, in our district, we have the options to interfund borrow from other funds besides fund one, our general fund. We also have the ability to borrow a TRAN or a tax and revenue anticipation note. So we would borrow money and then at a low interest rate and potentially pay that back once the state decides to pay the district the cash that they owe them. Uh, we can also have the option to borrow from the county office. Uh, we can borrow from the county treasurer. And there's also some discussion about state officials pursuing a statewide cash borrowing option for all school districts. So I know that's in the works and there's more to come on that, but the there are massive amounts of cash deferrals projected based on the state not knowing what their revenue will be in the future. And so just looking at it now, they are letting districts know that if there's not a backfill potentially of federal revenue or the tax revenues in the state are lower than anticipated, there will be a deferral of cash to districts. And what our district has always done and continues to do is work with the county office to uh, demonstrate our cash flow and to identify any area that we potentially would need to borrow cash. And just today I sent off to the county, um, the Orange County Department of Education, our current cash flow based on uh, the governor's signed budget. 
So as we move forward, we continue to monitor that and ensure that we have adequate cash to, again, our main uh, bills every month are payroll. And we want to make sure that we are uh, meeting our payroll as well as the other expenditures that we have in our district. So what are the some of the next steps? So again, continuing to monitor any updates to the state budget. It continues to change. It continues to evolve. Uh, this year is unlike any other year that I've been uh, at, that I've seen in education as far as uh, the uh, unknowns as we move forward based on funding because of the pandemic um, and the, the state revenues being so unpredictable at this time. Uh, in September, we will present the unaudited actuals, and that's how we close the books in 1920. And then the federal budget will hopefully be known and something will be uh, either passed or not passed with the HEROES Act. And that's what the uh, Congress is looking to do now. It will, again, will not be passed in July based on information I, I read today, but potentially in the first few weeks of August based on the federal government and, and their schedules. And then again, in December, our first interim will be presented and that will cover the period July 1st, 2020 to October 31st. And that lets us know how much revenue we received in that time frame, and then what our expenditures are. So we'll have a better idea in December on how we're doing related to the current budget that we have right now. And with that, I'll be more than happy to take any, by the way, thank you everyone for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Michael. All right, board members, do we have any questions for Michael at this time? I do have a one question. Um, and my question is this November, as you know, we have a, big proposition coming up um, in the November ballot, Proposition 15, as it's now called, or formerly known as Schools and Community First. If that does pass and it does close the loophole from the wealthiest corporations and whatnot, it's supposed to generate something like $11.5 billion um, for the state of California. When would that be, Michael, reflected on the budget or allocated or distributed to various districts throughout, assuming it does pass? Um, would that be in the 2021-22 school year or what, what's usually the timeline for things like that? So a lot of times, great question. Thank you for your question. A lot of times when something is on the ballot and then is passed, it usually takes effect around January uh, 1st timeframe. However, depending on the governor's decision of when he would implement that, uh, if it does pass, uh, it could potentially be in the next fiscal year uh, after, but even if it takes effect in January, because they would have to take time to rewrite the tax codes and, and ensure the funding is coming in and, and then how they would collect that. So again, the bulk of tax revenues come in in December and April. So I would anticipate potentially, even if it's passed and, and on the books and active January 1st, uh, we potentially would see the change in the next fiscal year. Thank you. Trustee Philbeck. Hi, Michael, thank you so much for always doing such a great job taking us uh, through this every time you do. I just am curious um, as far as the deferrals. In your experience, if, you know, with deferrals, uh, how long do the, is that usually? I mean, when could we expect to see the money? Um, if it's, you know, is it two months late, three months late, or what's... What's your opinion on that or your guesstimate of when we see money, if it's deferred? No, that's a great question. And what I've seen in the past, in my experience, it's, it's been months later, potentially, depending on, on the state revenues. And that's really, and, and in this case, it's not only state revenues, but it's also the federal government coming in and backfilling with, with money uh, allocated in the HEROES Act. However, just to uh, assure you, I have been in constant communication with the Orange County Department of Education, who has assured us that the county treasury in Orange County has enough cash for all districts to be able to borrow. Uh, and they've already done all of the calculations related to the deferrals for all of the districts in Orange County, including Anaheim. And they have assured us that there will be no issue borrowing cash from the county treasury in Orange County should we need to at any point in the future. So I feel confident that uh, knowing that and knowing that we also have other avenues to borrow money from, e whatever the state does, I think that we have plenty of mechanisms in place to be able to sustain our operations where we don't have to worry about it. Even if we need cash, I think we have enough mechanisms in place to be able to uh, obtain that cash to pay our bills. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, board members, does anyone else have a question for Michael? Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. 
All right. So moving on to C, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt. Is my microphone on? Adopt the revised 2020-2021 proposed budget as pre as presented. Can I get a motion? Philbeck so, so moved. So Roll a second. Trustee Philbeck, seconded by Trustee Rowellis. Discussion. All right, hearing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to D, continuity of learning plan update by Dr. Mary Grace, Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services. Thank you, board members. Board member McCullis, or President McCullis, board members and community. I am going to be presenting um, uh, our plan for our continuity of learning plan. And um, as I'm bringing it up, I wanted to inform uh, the board as well as the public that um, we will have a plan that will be due to the state uh, approved by our board by September 30th. And it will require several groups of stakeholder input. And so we plan to bring you the final continuity of learning plan to the board um, prior to the September 23rd uh, board meeting that we have. Okay, so um, this is uh, our continuity of learning plan, and it includes our move to a distance learning plan as well as some other components that are required. Uh, as we all know, there are various stages of reopening in the state of California. Uh, Orange County had been moving towards stage three, and when we were moving towards st stage three, we approved and got stakeholder feedback on a blended learning model. And as we all know, in recent weeks, uh, the governor has put Orange County onto a watch. So we're moving down back towards the low, uh, uh, stage two or stage one. And in response to that, we had to come up with some more options for reopening our schools. The uh, option on the left side of the screen, as we're looking at it, is um, our distance learning 3.0 and or our blended learning plan. And the plan on the right in the red is as you know, you approved us opening an online academy. As we have been looking at reopening over the course of the last several months, we've always been focused on uh, these four uh, main pillars. Uh, we want a continuity of learning for all students in the Anaheim Elementary School District. We wanted to ensure we had student and staff health and safety in the forefront, as well as the mental health and social emotional well-being of our students and our staff, and to take care of the needs of the community as we um, continue to stay home or we come to a blended learning model, we want to make sure our parents are supported and our students have that opportunity to learn. So recently, um, when the budget was passed, uh, there was a couple of trailer bills that went along with it. SB 98 had to do with education and it laid out the requirements for districts to conduct distance learning. We have to ensure, and as a board, you prepared this district over a number of years to do this. We have to make sure that all students have access to devices and connectivity. The plan has to deliver the high quality standards based um, instruction they would be receiving, our students would be receiving if they were sitting in their seats. We have to make sure that we're looking at um, any academic or losses of our students. So there's a loss of learning plan that's in place. We have to ensure that we are providing the services required in our students' IEPs. 
We have to ensure that we have designated an integrated ELD for our emergent bilingual students. And we have to have daily live interaction with teachers for instruction, progress monitoring, and maintaining that uh, school connectedness. So what will be different from 2021? And before I touch too much on this, you know, we met with, we conducted a survey with our students about distance learning as well as music during distance learning. And about 50% of our fourth through sixth graders participated uh, in that survey. And one of the things that rose to the top was that need for school connectedness, that need for um, human contact, even if it is going to be virtually. So, um, you know, we we have already let the board know that we are going to be providing live instruction through Microsoft Teams. Um, the, we're going to have a structured school day for our families. Um, we're going to ensure that they attend daily and participate in the online learning classes that they have. We will ensure our report cards are fair and equitable for our students and reflect the hard work that our teachers put into this work. Again, the emphasis on the uh, standards-based lessons as well as that social-emotional learning component. And we have to be able to assess and monitor our students' progress and address any learning loss early and often. In addition, it set out the criteria for the minimum requirement for minutes. And for our district, we uh, are going with the 240 minutes, which is aligned to our instructional planning day schedule that we've already had in place. So under the continuity of learning plan, um, the distance learning plan, where we will transition eventually to a blended learning plan, it's going to be coordinated uh, with our Ed Services team and the school sites. In addition, we have our Anaheim Elementary Online Academy, which will just operate as it normally would if we were not in a pandemic. They still will be on the instructional planning day so that all of our families are on the same calendars through this year. And it will also be coordinated by the school site as well as supported by Ed Services. And again, those requirements below are embedded into all the learning that will take place with our students in distance learning. We've also um, updated, traditionally we have uh, what's called a homeschool compact between the school, the family, and the students. We've updated it and we'll um, work through our families and students with that to ensure everybody understands their role in this new learning environment. And um, most of it is uh, similar to the in-school homeschool compa compact. However, it's really putting an effort on if and when a child doesn't come to class that we immediately notify a chain of people that can start to reach out to the family and troubleshoot the reason the um, child's not at school that the family will do their best to um, engage in the learning and communicate with the teacher, and that the students will do their best to attend and participate in their learning. So previously we presented, you know, what distance learning was to the board, but just as a reminder, um, distance learning will have both synchronous virtual instruction with their teacher and asynchronous, where they're independently working and practicing on the skills that they've just learned from their teacher. And that's just a review of the synchronous. We will be providing the synchronous through uh, the Microsoft Teams, as well as our learning platforms, Seesaw and Google Classroom. And it will also allow teachers to give that instant feedback to our students as they are learning um, concepts maybe for the first time or getting some preview review instruction from their teacher. So the asynchronous will, you know, obviously the students will be learning at home. Um, they'll, it's somewhat self-paced. The instruction can also be pre-recorded and put into the uh, learning management software so that kids have something to go back to 
to refresh their memory about the lessons that they've been given. And then we'll also be able to provide feedback to our students and our families through multiple modalities. In addition, we want to make sure that we are addressing the needs of our students who are in, have special education needs. And there's, there's two types of uh, students. Some of our students are in our general education classes. So they will attend the synchronous learning with their classmates and their teacher. And then after that synchronous instruction is over, they will be provided their related services that are outlined for them in their IEP with their special ed provider in Microsoft Teams. In addition, we have special day class placements. Those are students who the majority of their day is spent in a smaller class size with working on individualized goals and support from uh, a teacher that's credentialed with special ed. They too will receive their related services uh, via Microsoft Teams. We have a continuity of learning plan for all, and in Anaheim Elementary, all means from three-year-olds to 12-year-olds. So we do have a plan for our preschool teachers, our preschool students and teachers to implement. At, right now, it'll start off as an asynchronous plan, and our teachers will set up, be able to use Microsoft Meet, similar to what we're doing right now, to meet with the families and um, as the year goes on, we hope to transition some devices to the house that the children can then interact with their teachers as well through Microsoft uh, Teams. So uh, the, you may or may not recall with the blended learning plan, we had the students coming to school two days a week in two different groups, and then they would learn at home three days a week. And um, so this closely mimics that because our hope, and as everyone has articulately said from the governor to the superintendent of Orange County um, Schools, everyone wants to be back in the seats. We want our kids and our teachers to be in those classrooms, you know, enjoying learning and activities. Um, so we wanna keep our schedule as consistent as possible for our family so that they can get into a routine and they can um, be uh, successful. So we're going to mimic that with the distance learning will be conducted through the majority of time, Monday through Thursday. Uh, we'll have those daily instructional minutes um, and depending on the grades, there's about anywhere up to about 150 minutes of synchronous instruction for all students. And then some will get more through interventions and or um, their IEP related services. We're gonna start every single day with a focus on the social emotional learning and continue to support the community as well through our Wellness Wednesdays. We have a good plan in place to provide intervention and IEP services. We'll still be able to conduct live music sessions. And then our teachers will have office hours for students and families that are predictable with um, communication channels that are open to all so we can keep that homeschool connection in place. Then on Friday, again, we have to remember the requirements of SB 98 is that live interaction daily. So on Fridays, the teacher, the student day will look like that beginning of the morning, check in with my teacher, check in with my classmates, have the social emotional learning, go over any assignments that might be outstanding. And then the kids will continue to work in an asynchronous environment the rest of the day on Friday. And the teacher workday will consist of that check-in. And that's a time for our teachers to plan. Um, we'll hold some staff meetings and our professional learning as needed. And it will also give our teams the time to really um, look at where our students are and do individualized assessments. And it will provide um, everybody the time for us to catch up on all of the special ed um, requirements that we need to um, take care of. So for pupil learning loss, uh, we have to be able to show what strategies we used. And we've created sample schedules for all of our 
start times. We have a 7.30 start time, an 8.10 start time, and an 8.50 start time. We have our classroom teachers that are that first point of learning. They, be, they provide the best first instruction for our students. Um, however, we know that over the course of the last uh, three or four months of school that some of our students may have created some or experienced some learning loss. So we're very fortunate that we're able to have um, our teachers on special assignment available to support the schools. Uh, I believe there's two to three at every single school that will be able to support kids um, and teachers and providing that targeted differentiation and or um, filling in some learning loss. And we're really happy that after a couple of days, looking at all those schedules, we think we've presented something, we know we have, where our TK through three students, they'll have their synchronous classroom with their teachers in the beginning of the day. And our four through six students will be either, um, if they're on or above grade level, they might be doing some asynchronous learning or projects. If they are needing some support or they have uh, special ed related services, they will be getting that in the morning from a TOSA and or a credentialed uh, special ed teacher. And then we'll flip flop that morning and afternoon so that all of our students will benefit from the synchronous learning from their gen ed homeroom teacher, if you will. And then they'll all get something more because we do need that we do know that all of our students will need something more. So we're really excited about that. And I think we got the last kinks worked out in that today. So for student participation and outreach, we have to put together a plan that um, has meets these four components. We have to make contact and we have to make contact um, immediately and consistently with our families to ensure that you know, they're okay, that they have what they need to um, learn at home. We have to ensure they have the connectivity. So students have to have either a Chromebook or personal device, and they have to have the internet. And then the engagement. You know, We have to look at whether or not kids are engaging in the distance learning, if they're logging into the Teams and or the other virtual instruction that's available. And we've created a tracking Sheet, for lack of a better way to put that, for teachers to let us know immediately if any children are not participating, whether it's in um, their small group instruction for, or their synchronous instruction with their teachers, so that we have a team of people on the ready to start making phone calls home and troubleshoot how we can get kids back into class and learning. And finally, um, we have to be able to show that our kids participated and um, completed assignments given by their teachers. So we do have to continue to ensure that we are providing increased and improved services for our underserved students. And that is our English learners, our foster youth, and our low-income students. And these are some of the supports that we've already put in place um, when we were in the earlier school dismissal that we're going to continue. Um, we'll have the designated and integrated ELD. Our families will have access to Rosetta Stone in multiple languages to help support that uh, continued growth. For our foster youth, we're providing technology support. We work hand in hand with any social workers to ensure immediately upon enrollment, we're able to place them at a school and get them connected. We're gonna continue. Uh, we have some of our teachers that are providing foster youth mentoring and others are providing foster youth tutoring. So they'll still be able to, to conduct those activities via the Microsoft team. And then also for our low income students, ensuring that they have the Chromebooks and hotspots and they have the technology support should they need it to be able to access their um, learning. So when we do come back, um, we also kind of alluded to all the work that um, we've been working on, thanks to the leadership of our uh, risk manager, uh, Tracy Golden, to ensure that staff and uh, students are going to be safe when it is when we are ready to come back. So uh, we'll have different scheduling. Um, we'll, we'll be cognizant of movement around the campus. 
All of the breaks, the lunches will be monitored and scheduled so that kids can go out and interact yet still be safe in a social distancing manner. Um, we'll keep track of, you know, who's going in those um, high, high use areas, the restrooms, the lunch areas, common areas, so that they are often cleaned by staff. The student schedules will be mindful of those breaks. Uh, making sure we build in time to stretch and or go outside, walk around the school, um, have a brain break, as well as uh, playgrounds temporarily will be off limits as um, we don't want to um, create uh, a condition that might not be healthy. Um, also, we're, we have training in place for staff and students. Uh, we'll be also, we're in the process of uh, producing some videos to kind of get home right away uh, so that families understand, you know, what it will look like to come pick up their lunches or um, you'll learn later about our child care program. We'll be pro providing transportation so kids might be getting on buses. What, what will that look like? So we want to prepare them before they start that process. Um, we've also updated some board policies. We've updated our injury and illness prevention plan. And um, we're in the we're preparing messaging for protocols and guidance should there be an exposure at one of our school sites of COVID-19. Also, again, I alluded to the procedures for transportation. We'll be asking, you know, an adult to be at the bus stop in case the student is showing symptoms of um, the COVID-19 or has a fever. Our bus drivers and our staff will be will be wearing face coverings such as masks and masks and shields. Um, the guidelines are changing daily, um, but we nailed it down today that the new guidance from the governor and the California Department of Public Health that came out last Friday are that students in third through sixth grade are, are required to wear a mask or a face covering unless it's recommended by their IEP, a 504 team, or an individual health plan that they can't wear it. And then students in PK to second grade, that it's strongly encouraged to wear a mask. Our buses will be disinfected before and after each bus route, and all high-touch services will be cleaned frequently. We'll have social distancing as well as um, assigned seating and the bus drivers will be, get training on how to support kids and families with that. Mental health and social emotional well-being. As I said in our schedule, um, our, S, our social emotional learning and our wellness curriculum is going to be center stage. We want to make sure that our kids are prepared uh, socially, emotionally to learn. And um, all of our school psychologists, school counselors, we have behavioral health aides as um, that will be able to provide that educationally based mental health support should it be needed. We still have our community partnerships and referral process with Western Youth Services and Phoenix House. And then we'll continue to conduct mental health trainings and check-ins with our staff and families. Also, I'm sorry, that is a duplicate side. On to school nutrition. As we did throughout the school dismissal, we're working very closely with our food service provider. Our main food service provider is the Anaheim Union High School District. Right now, our first priority, our main priority is to ensure that our families know about the meal application and they know how to find it online and are able to fill it out prior to school starting. We will have curbside breakfast and lunch available to all AESD students daily. And we, within each school's schedule, we've scheduled out an hour for families to be able to not only um, enjoy a meal, but go out and pick it up should they need to. Um, we're working with the high school district. Each of the students will have a barcode meal card. So they will be able to, with that meal card, go to any elementary, junior high, or high school to pick up their lunch and breakfast. So they'll get the two meals at the same time. 
In addition, again, thanks to our, our other partner with the Anaheim Family YMCA, they will still provide the uh, snack and supper at the end of each day to students. Community needs and child care. Um, our Anaheim Family YMCA will be providing, it's limited child care, uh, and we're working with them to ensure that we're able to support any family that needs a place for their children during the school day. Um, and it will be open from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, parents interested can um, register on the Anaheim YMCA website. Um, and while the kids are here, they will have their Chromebooks and the YMCA will have the schedule of each of the grade levels and they'll ensure that during that synchronous learning time that they're logged on and participating and then support them just like they would in our after school program with completing their homework. So we're really excited about that. And they'll be on site where there will be support. Um, we're going to continue our Wellness Wednesdays to provide support to families. We're gearing up some training for parents so that they're confident in supporting their kids at home with the technology. And we're going to continue to work with the, the newest partnerships with the Latino Health Access and UCI in providing the COVID-19 testing information sites and availability, as well as training for parents around, you know, how to prevent it and how to help support families that need support. So with that, um, I'll be open it up for questions. Thank you so much for all your hard work, Dr. Grace. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and let's just go with a, a last slide that you presented with regards to the YMCA and the limited child care. Do you have mm -hmm. a with regards to some of the barriers or some of the things that they have in place, plexiglass? Uh, dis are, are you aware of any of the... Uh, the, the changes they've done at the YMCA. And by the way, I'm very grateful uh, to the YMCA. Yes, they, um, they're currently conducting summer camp at five of our school sites. And those school sites were already set up for distance learning in the classrooms that they're using. Um, every morning when people come onto the summer camp, uh, the employees from the YMCA are screened, just like our employees will be. And they talk to the parents about uh, symptoms of the children. Okay. And um, so we'll continue with that. And they will be at our school sites. So the classroom setup will be provided, the social distancing will be provided. They'll still, the kids will still be required to wear the face coverings and uh, follow the same protocols that we'll have in place when we have students back on campus. Wonderful. Thanks, Mary. And my second question is with regards to uh, a few slides back when you were talking about tracking uh, sheets. And I love uh -huh. how you know, there's so many stakeholders who are going to, you know, make sure that the students are okay and, you know, mm -hmm. find why they are not uh, participating. My worry, though, is Will the students be deemed, I mean, during COVID, who knows what our families are going through at the time. Mm -hmm. Will our teachers provide an alternative opportunity to make up points? Uh, you know, I just uh, want to know uh, if there's anything in place with regards to that. Yes, we, um, in talking with Dr. Downing earlier today, we also want to figure out how we can provide um, some Saturday catch up and tutoring for kids and families. So we're gonna be putting that put that together. So remember when we talked about the um, Anaheim Online Academy, we found out that most of our, many of our kids were doing most of their schoolwork or interacting with their school applications and programs on the, in the evenings or on the weekends. So we'll, we'll work with families, um, you know, what, what's hard is generally if somebody was not participating, you know, we'd get in our car and go out to their house and help problem solve and figure it out. So we'll have to really be um, aware of that and also ensure that, um, you know, uh, Elsa shared with me earlier today that some of the people on our, that are answering our phones right now, you know, parents are calling them and our parents are truly scared with the data that is in Anaheim, they, you know, they, they were worried about having to bring their kids out and put them in schools. 
they know that's the best place for them, but you know, there's concerns in our community and we want to continue to work with our, um, you know, our social emotional committee on that and how we can best serve our family, but also, you know, our employees coming back to work. Like they're going to have needs as well and working with everybody so that everybody is um, aware of all of the needs and we can address them when we can and then provide leniency, if you will, where we need it. And I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. It does. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Mm -hmm. Any other board members have any questions for Dr. Grace at this time? Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a few uh, things. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, we're going to start each day with uh, social emotional learning, and I think that's fantastic. But my concern is uh, maybe uh, supporting our teachers with knowing how to do that. Uh, you had mentioned some trainings for staff, but mm -hmm. I don't think it was specifically triggered or uh, connected to the idea of providing our teachers with uh, strategies or lessons that they could use in the morning. And I was wondering if we have any plans for training them in any way. Um, thank you for that. We have a, a curriculum that uh, has been in place that it's funny. When I was a principal, I had a group of rambunctious five-year-olds in my kindergarten. And um, I really worked with my teachers to implement that social emotional learning curriculum we have. It's called Second Step. And what it does is it, it models and it, um, you know, even before... Uh, circles were a thing, restorative circles were a thing. It provides that um, opportunity for class meetings and discussions and um, conversations. So we'll continue to implement the um, second step curriculum. And um, we also, a good majority of our teachers have been um, trained with, you know, the capturing kids hearts. So going back to, you know, those, you, you can't have their head unless you have their heart. So we will review some of that training and ensure that our principals, one of the things we're going to be doing with our principals and our leaders in the district is we're going to be reading a book. It's called Permission to Feel. And it's recognizing uh, when somebody is uh, stressed or there's something emotionally um, off, if you will, and um, helping them, you know, be aware of that because without the awareness, we could just go back as if it's the first day of school and it, let's just march through what we normally do. But we really want to take a pause and make sure that we're all checking in on each other and that we're all taking care of each other, whether it's, you know, um, teacher to student, family to teacher, principal to teacher. So we do have a, a plan in place to start supporting that and making that the focus. Sure, no, I'm aware of the second step and capturing kids' heart. I'm thinking more, are there, can we create additional lessons and strategies to give teachers? Because I know they might have already experienced those things, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking a newer, fresher, how to deal with distance learning, how to, the stress of being online, new, new connections for our families and our kids. I, I would appreciate it if you could look into maybe researching more. Um, and then yeah. I also, um, uh, we had mentioned that we're making some videos to, uh, train our parents um, about what things will look like or train your kids on how to enter a bus, things like that. But I'm thinking, mm -hmm. is it possible for us to hold maybe a webinar or a town hall within the next week or so where we're actually explaining to our families in different languages, maybe have uh, one in Spanish at one time, one in English at another time, a Korean one at another time, where mm -hmm. we're actually saying to parents, look, this is what happened in the spring. That was crisis learning. Right, this is where we're moving towards in the fall with distance learning. Here's how it all works out. Here's here here's what you should expect. Here's the schedule, um, and also talk about the ideas because our options have changed. Right, so at one point, uh, as parents were thinking that we're going to have a blended model choice or our virtual academy choice, but now it's going back to distance learning. So I'm thinking about families that maybe signed up for the academy, but now that all the sites are going. Uh, the distance learning, they might want to change their mind and go back to their site, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can explain all those intricacies to our families, it would be fantastic. That way we can share it all over the place and perhaps even make a graphic organizer with that information we could distribute at the meal distribution sites. 
Yes, I'll work. We'll work with that in cabinet. Um, and I lost my thought while you were saying something I was going to share, but it'll come back to me. I'll get it back to you. But those are all uh, that's a great idea. And we can begin to uh, look at scheduling those. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all I have. Appreciate it. All right. Any other board members? Trustee Philbeck? Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Grace, for that very informative presentation. This is more of a, not necessarily a curriculum question, but in the format that we're at now with this distance learning, I'm just wondering if you have any ideas or if you've heard sort of how, I know we've talked about parent leadership groups. You know, our, our PTAs have always been so amazingly strong and such a part uh, of our school activities and partnerships, are we are how is that going to function? I mean, are, are there are there going to be zooms? Are the schools going? You know, collectively, are we going to? How are we going to keep this the PTA movement together? Or has there even been any discussion about that within the parent leadership? I was asked to stop something. Hold on, let me. Um... Hold on, sorry. Um, yes, uh, Jackie, we do have our, um, all of our meetings scheduled for our district uh, committees and groups. And we've been, uh, Yesenia has been meeting with, I think today or yesterday, she just met with the uh, PTA council. We're working out those dates. We have our parent leadership dates in place. And one of the things we really wanna do for with our parent leadership groups, I think this is like year five or six. So we really want to um, empower those uh, veterans, if you will, the, the parent leaders that have been here for you know three, four, five, six years to begin to really grow the groups at their school site and ensure that they have those communication protocols in place to you know help each other as well as you know, keep the families connected through the schools. Uh, the, we'll continue to have meets through uh, the Google Meets. We can also, um, one of the things that was in the distance learning survey was um, it pointed out the power of our YouTube channel. So I think we need to capitalize on that and use that more often as well, whether it's for a town hall like uh, board member Alvarez indicated or, um, some of our uh, programs and practices that we have in place for our parents. So um, the team is putting a plan together and we have dates in place. We were just kind of trying to wait until the school calendar settled mm -hmm. to make sure that um, parents were available for learning for their kids and then could attend parent things later in the day. Thank you. And then just secondly, um, just a little more information on what the music uh, programming through the distance learning is is going to look like. If you could give me some examples of what that's going to look like for the actual instruction online. Yes, um, through the Microsoft Teams, uh, the music teachers will every class will still have a scheduled music uh, session, and the music teacher will take over the class. And um, whether it's demonstrating how to use instruments or through for our uh, fifth and sixth graders or general music for our TK through fourth grade. Um, our teachers have a plan. Um, the Save the Music and the NAM Foundation saw the plan and they felt like we were um, one of the most prepared districts to provide continued um, music learning and very excited. Uh, Disneyland reached out and asked if we were still interested in partnering with them on um, purchasing instruments. So we've, we are going to get more instruments into kids' hands. And we'll have a general rollout of getting the instruments back out to kids in homes. Because if you read the music study, kids did perform at home for their families with those instruments. So we still want to be able to support that um, and figure out how to get the instruments back into kids' hands. Thank you. That was going to be the second part is Okay. Are we going to get the instruments in their hands and how we're going to do that? But we'll wait for that um, roll up. But I'm glad you're you're on it and you brought that up. So thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Great question, Trustee Philbeck. I love that. 
Thank you so much. Uh, do any other board members have any questions for Dr. Grace at this time? Yes, Paula, I had a couple for Dr. Magala. Trustee Lopez. Thank you. Um, okay. A couple of questions. Uh, this was specifically about uh, the schedules uh, that I had a question, but I guess it could go for, it could apply to a lot of different aspects of reopening. Uh, but specifically on slide 15, uh, you had mentioned um, the schedules. And so I, I'm just curious if we collaborated with our partner district uh, at the high school district, just because a lot of our families overlap um, mm -hmm. in developing that schedule, did we work with them at all? Yes. Um... Early on, Manuel and I were in contact with each other about the various plans that we were having. And uh, when we were on blended learning, we're like, this is perfect because um, the kids are, would, it will allow the high schoolers to be home with the elementary if needed and vice versa, um, be us be in school. The most recent, uh, believe it or not, you know, real-time collaboration was about the lunch hour, was making sure that all families, that all the kids would be going to lunch within the same two-hour time frame so that those siblings could assist with that as well. Um, uh, I, I haven't seen the what their final distance learning plan will look like. I know they're shoring up some of those things. Okay, thank you. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, straining, I was straining my eyes to see some of the uh, verbiage here on the slide. So, but thank you for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, my second question had to do with slide 14. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, special education instruction placement. Mm -hmm. um, in a subsequent slide, you mentioned that there would be masks um, for transportation. And that sounded like a state mm -hmm. guideline. I'm wondering for the uh, slide 14 for the instruction, have we gotten those plans? Are they based on uh, state guidelines, federal guidelines, both, neither, or something else? Well, as a special education teacher, you know that nobody is willing to give any guidance to special ed right now. And if you don't know, um, you should know that we're not getting any guidance. Um, but our OC SELPA group, like, Kristen is in a meet with um, all the OC SELPA directors because one of the things that we are committed to doing is we, in the county is to be consistent with what we're doing. Um, we feel good about uh, we're meeting the um, time that we need with kids. Will it be easy? Um, no, but it's we've never backed away from a challenge. So there hasn't been any relaxation of any um, timelines or instructional minutes within an IEP. So we're, you know, we have a, a heavy lift at the beginning to ensure that we're communicating with our families about, you know, the why things are different and how we're going to ensure that we're doing our best. Uh, over the summer for extended school year, we were practicing uh, the, the small group instructions with our uh, speech language pathologists. That's how they provided services in extended school year. And that worked out well. It seems like the families really appreciated that and were able to attend to it. Um, so we're as confident as we can with that moving target and literally no guidance. Um, it's my understanding that there was also that on behalf of special ed in California, there uh, was a lawsuit filed against Governor Newsom, Superintendent um, Tony Thurman, and the count, the state health officer. So we knew that this would be coming, but we, you know, again, we're confident, we're prepared, and we're going to do what's best by our kids. And um, we think that we have relationships where we need them with our families. Okay, thank you for the answer. I. That was my suspicion that there was a lack or absence uh, of guidance. So I was mm -hmm. just hoping it would be otherwise, but thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Trustee Ruelas. Um, no, I just want to applaud you, Dr. Grace, and your team. I think your presentation is very thorough. I think that you guys have thought about a lot of the different aspects of everything. Um, to just kind of piggyback off of my 
um, colleague, uh, uh, Trustee Alvarez's comments. I do think, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to fall on the shoulders of the Ed Division. I think it's more or less kind of a district thing. It should also involve ELSA, um, et cetera, about educating just our parents about this and really making them understand um, the difference between what it's going to look like this fall versus what it was when school abruptly ended on March 13th. I do applaud us in regards to what we did March 13th, but obviously it was difficult, especially for a lot of our teachers um, that didn't have a lot of the necessary professional development or our students who hadn't been exposed to that type of dynamic. So um, to just reiterate, if we can just really think of a great way of making sure that we're publicizing to everybody and educating them about this new start and uh, new educational environment. Um, but overall, kudos to you and your team for a very thorough and well thought out plan. All right, uh, uh, Board Clerk Alvarez has another question. Yeah, I just, uh, just came to thought right now. Uh, I'm assuming this is uh, okay, but I just wanna double check that we're okay with our technology and our hotspots regarding the amount of kids that are coming in. You know, I know some of the, all the laptops kind of shifted to the next grade because the kids kept them. But do we have enough to then distribute? Are we collected back to distribute to the incoming students? And are we going to be okay with that financially? Um, yes and no. Uh, we, we did have, we have a cache of Chromebooks. Uh, again, uh, I think on March 16th, Chris said to us, if you can find them, you need to buy them. So we did buy them and we were able to sustain throughout the summer with, with Chromebooks. We have 1200 additional hotspots that have come in. Nice. And um, the one thing that you were alluding to uh, board member Alvarez is usually our sixth graders return their Chromebooks and then we shuffle them all around. Um, but we're, we're not able to do that shuffling. So what we are doing to ensure that our TK and kinder families um, have success with their technology is we are gonna be buying some more uh, touch screen Chromebooks because that's more developmentally appropriate for that grade level. And we're gonna make a, we're gonna be setting appointments for our TK and kinder families to come in, get their uh, devices, a hotspot if they need it, they'll get a, an orientation into how to log in and what the programs are. So we have a plan in place prior to school start for that. Sounds wonderful, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions, board members? Hearing none, thank you so much, Dr. Grace. All right, everybody, it's time for the consent calendar. Items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by, by the board in one motion. There's no discussion of these items unless a member of the board, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar. So before we vote, board members at this time, do we have any items to pull? Uh, Lopez, I'd like to pull item B4, which is on page five. Thank you, Trustee Lopez. Trustee Philbeck? Yes, thank you. I would like to pull, I need to pull item, I believe it's B7. It's on top of page six. All right. Any more board members? Okay, hearing none, it is recommended that, hearing that there are no more, uh, it is recommended the Board of Education approve and ratify the following consent calendar items with the exception of B4 and B seven so moved. can i get him Rallis. thank you trustee Rallis. can i get a second second lopez seconded by trustee lopez discussion hearing none board roll call vote trustee ruelas aye trustee philbeck aye trustee lopez aye board clerk alvarez aye i vote aye passes five zero let's go ahead and go to page five item b4 it is recommended the board of education approve an amendment to an agreement between the district and a station or i station 8150 north central expressway 
Suite 2000, Dallas, Texas, 75206, to increase the agreement by $7,500 to include remote professional development trainings for DLI teachers in iStation reading in Espanol program. Original agreement was approved at the June 24, 2020 board meeting for $80,000 and $127,000. Uh, the new fee for this service shall not exceed $87,627. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Lopez. So moved by Trustee Lopez. Can I get a second? Ruelas. Seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Let's go ahead and discuss this. All right. Thank you, President Magalas. Uh, I just want to pull this item because um, it's regarding uh, professional development training for our DLI teachers. Um mm-hmm. I believe it was last year uh, we had discussed having a um, kind of a quarterly update just on our DLI program in general. I just wanted to ask the superintendent um, if he could include uh, how this training is going once it's completed Mm. in our next, um, whenever we have our next DLI update. I know that uh, we had planned to do it on a quarterly basis, so it's a regular update, um, but because of uh, obvious circumstances that have occurred since then, um, it, it hasn't happened as regularly as I'd hoped, but uh, that would be my request that this be part of, you know, just teacher feedback, our staff feedback on how this training is and how, how they're doing with this when we get our next update. Thank you. Yes, it will happen, uh, Trustee Lopez. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other board members want to discuss this? Hearing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Let's go ahead and go to page six. So on page six, Jackie pulled... B7, it is recommended the Board of Ed approve for 2020-2021 an agreement uh, number SCI OCR 04 between this district and Children and Families Commission of Orange County, 1505 East 17th Street, Suite 230, Santa Ana, California, 92705 to accept $50,000 to engage community leaders to implement and promote awareness and building capacity related to early child care and education for children zero to five years of age and their families. Can I get a motion? So moved. Rellis. Moved by Trustee Rellis. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. The reason that I pulled this item is that I am also a commissioner for the Children and Families Commission of Orange County. So although um, I approve, I will abstain from the official vote on this item. All right. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Anybody else want to discuss this? Yeah, I had, none, quick, let's go ahead. I had a quick question. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Magalas. Um, you know, I appreciate Jackie. I know Jackie is uh, a real workhorse and she's always um, mm-hmm. you know, involved in a lot of committees and everything. I, I'm just wondering if we have a legal opinion that Jackie can't. I know the optics of it are that we don't want Jackie to be in a situation where it looks like she's you know, voting on things. And if so, w- what that would be or what it has been. I'm sure that's been looked at. So I'm just curious because I know we've had a lot of these items coming up lately. And it's great you're doing the, the work with uh, Children and Families Commission. Uh, so I applaud you for it. I'm just kind of curious on, you know, I'm sure we'll have future items similar to this. So just thought it'd be an appropriate time to ask. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also I'll have Dr. Downing weigh in on this because I always yeah, do right. check. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. And I always check with the commission also just, you know, to they're aware of the item on the agenda. It's, uh, but I, I can tell you, it's just more for, uh, so that there doesn't appear since money is being involved and I serve on both boards. I serve on this one and I'm a good commissioner for that one, just so there's not any appearance of uh, any impropriety here. So, but Dr. Downing, um, and you usually suggest this also, Dr. Downing. So if you yes. would, please. When we, when we review the final board agenda, uh, we make recommendations uh, to Ms. Philbeck. She errs on the side of caution um, in terms of abstaining from these votes, 
Uh, but we also check with the appropriate agencies to ensure that there is no conflict of interest. So I think in the majority of cases, it's board member feedback erring on the side of caution. And, and also I have been told that, and this also it happens with the YMCA because I also serve on the YMCA board. And it's kind of like once you do abstain on these items, it's I've been advised that it's best even legally, you know, I've been advised that it's best to follow that pattern and not, you know, um, vote on some and not vote on others. Just, you know, when, when the issues come up regarding other boards that I serve on, um, which really isn't that often. It's just to keep the continuity going and go ahead and abstain. So that's why I do. But I always check on every item just to be sure anyways. And I, okay. well, I'm supportive I always get it. the same advice. I, I always, you know, so that's it. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. I will abstain. Thank you. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Four ayes, one abstention. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the action calendar. 9A, Superintendent's Office, there is none. 9B, Educational Services, there is none. 9C, SELPA, there is none. 9D, Human Resources, it is recommended the Board of Education approve the revision of the tentative agreement between this district and the California School Employees Association and its Chapter 54 uh, due to a typographical error. Can I get a motion? So moved, Ruelas. So Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to two. Uh, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2020-21-02 regarding the layoff of a classified employee for the 2020-2021 school year, effective September 30, 2020. Can I get a motion? So, so moved. Second. Lopez. So moved by Trustee Lopez, seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Discussion. Hearing none, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye passes 5-0. Right. Give me a second. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the appointment of employee number 07 two 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 zero two zero dash zero one to the position of principal effective july 23 2020 this individual will be assigned to the anaheim elementary online academy now i'm going to go ahead and motion this can i get a second second albert second, Alvarez. second <laughs> discussion Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. Uh, and I vote aye. Passes 5-0. I'd like to give the floor to Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dina Milan, who will introduce the new principal. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Anna Kim. Anna began working in education in 2005 and most recently served as the vice principal of Olive Street School. Prior to that, she worked as a teacher on special assignment and a classroom teacher. We are happy to welcome Anna Kim as the principal of the new Anaheim Elementary Online Academy as she begins in this new position tomorrow. Congratulations, Anna. All right, congratulations, 
Principal Anna. Uh, moving on to administrative services, there is none. And finally, uh, item 10, board discussion. 10A, board member activities related to school business. Trustee Ruelas, it's, it's on you. Uh, thank you, President Nagales. Um, nothing really too much to report. Um, I was able to participate in just one of our ongoing um, community service projects that we've been doing uh, at the Veterans Hall that's been organized by uh, Maritza Bermudez, one of the parents in the Anaheim Elementary School District. Um, her and as well as all of um, a lot of our PLI parents that participate in this who, you know, go out and take leadership and distribute the food out to the various communities. And this time around, we moved from um, just straight uh, milk products um, to cheeses and all sorts of stuff. This time around, we had vegetables as well. So um, that took place last week and it benefited um, hundreds upon hundreds of our um, AESD families. And uh, on that note, that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Trustee Ruelas. Trustee Philbeck. Also, not much, um, just meetings. I, and I will uh, say a little bit about the YMCA meeting. But I also, I think it was uh, Trustee Lopez, I think you were involved in the the kind of the event that was the fundraiser for the uh, apartment fire group. Yeah. And, and so and I did stop by that, but I, I just wondered if anybody knew how that's going. If, I mean, you know, did the fun, I know I think there was a couple of fundraisers. Is everything? Does anybody know if that yeah, situation is, is okay? Throughout the month of, um, you're talking about the one for the, our families in Edison, correct? So yes, yeah, they've been having fundraisers throughout the month of June and July, and um, they've been collecting um, donations, both household items because everything was gone, as well as clothing. Um, and I know that they're always still willing to be accepting some more. I do know that one of the families has found a, a permanent apartment now and has been moved in, um, but we're still working on furnishing uh, that apartment and helping them uh, with those resources. Okay, thank you for that update, Ryan. And other than that, just the, the YMCA, um, you know, we, we had to um, basically cancel the sports programs, the basketball and such. Um, we are still, and I was trying to check on this today, we, we are still doing uh, swimming lessons, I believe at the Pearson Park Pool, um, which involves parents too. I'm not exactly sure of the days. Uh, first, I was told weekends, and I was told during the week. But we are doing that, and also the you know the day camps at our schools. Uh, camp Fox was canceled this year. Also, you know, Camp Fox is a is a big big YMCA deal. You know, with the the kids going. I mean, back from 150 years ago when I was in school, uh, Camp Fox was just the big deal every summer. And so they had a virtual Camp Fox, and kids were participating virtually, which is kind of our new normal but so there was some of that that came through but basically you know as far as YMCA it's been difficult too and you know a lot of the programs are are just uh, not happening for right now but um, you know except for the swimming and then the day camps so thank you that's my report all right thank you trustee Philbeck trustee Lopez all right. Thank you, President Magalis. Uh, nothing to report, uh, really. Um, I just want to wish everybody a restful next couple of weeks before we get back to school. Uh, look forward to having a report in a month. Thank you. <laughs> so humble, Trusty Lopez. I did see a picture of you at the uh, uh, fundraising event for that family. So great work uh, for, uh, you know, participating in that. Uh, Board Clerk Alvarez. I just want to uh, just commend our social media team and everyone who's doing the behind the, uh, behind the scenes work with responding to parents, making all the phone calls back that are being called into the district office regarding families who are signing up for the virtual academy or then not signing up anymore or then changing their mind, taking all those calls and fielding them, as well as um, I noticed the activity on the social media when I respond to things, people take care of those issues right away. So. I just want to say thank you to everyone involved with 
communicating with our families and making sure that they're answering questions as quickly as possible and calling them back. Um, that work is important. I think we should continue doing so, and I have full confidence that we will. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Board Clerk Alvarez. All right. So like many of y'all, uh, I'm sure Zoom has been a huge part of your lives. Uh, I've been attending many meetings and webinars via Zoom. Um, the first one uh, was with the Latino Health Access, uh, the County of Orange, the City of Anaheim, and uh, UC Irvine. Uh, they actually had a very detailed report, uh, as similar to our last board meeting, where there were, you know, uh, empirical research from epidemiologists uh, talking about the context of the unfortunate situation we are here in Orange County, particularly in the city of Anaheim. So I'm extremely grateful for everyone who uh, was part of that and for inviting me to be part of that uh, meeting. Uh, I also attended, and Trustee Philbeck, you have uh, forgot to share uh, the meeting with the CSBA uh, with the other Orange County board members. I did attend that meeting as well with Trustee Philbeck. Yes, I did. Thank you so much. And I'll just let you go ahead. And it was great. But yeah, I knew there was another meeting in there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you all have been so busy. I think this is our busiest summer ever. And uh, I applaud all of our board members and cabinet and all of our staff during these critical times. Um, and uh, I also attended, uh, Trustee Alvarez, you forgot to share uh, the Zoom uh, uh, meeting we had last week with the school reopening committee and uh, again and I say this in every board meeting I'm extremely proud of uh, the transparency we have and the input that we have from community members teachers principals all staff in our cabinet uh, in all of this is decision making with regards to this critical time in our nation's history with COVID so thank you um, so that was a great meeting. Uh, I was also on a panel that was organized by Accord and the Teachers for Social Justice in Orange County. Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. I know you're a member, uh, a panelist for uh, with regards to ethnic studies on the front line. So it was great to be part of that. Uh, I did also uh, listen on it with the Orange County Board of Education meeting. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, and I also went to, uh, attended a webinar. There's actually a series of webinars uh, from our state superintendent uh, of uh, instruction, Tony Thurman on ethnic studies. Uh, every week he has uh, amazing uh, speakers, professors, uh, advocates uh, in the movement that are speaking on behalf of the model curriculum that will hopefully be adopted uh, next year. So at that time, that's all I have to report. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to future agenda items. Board members, do we have any future agenda items? I do if no one else does. Okay, Trustee uh, Philbeck. But also, and something I forgot, uh, Mark, I'm not sure I actually answered your question when you brought up about if legal had been consulted about when I abstained. Yes. No, you I did. Have. Yeah. I'm, oh, I, I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember if I told you that, but yeah, actually have. Between uh, you and the tag team of Dr. Downing, I I will yeah. defer to you both on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, what I was, this doesn't have to be an agenda item, but it could be. Um, I wouldn't mind if it was. What I would like to ask is just so, for some more information regarding our supplies and how we order them specifically are now that you know things have changed drastically um and i know people are are wondering how, if we have our supplies in place which we do but you know i can tell you that i've been trying to order clorox wipes for six months and has has <laughs> never been successful seriously <laughs> not, not once have i you know out of stock out of stock so i think people are wondering and i'm kind of would like a little more information too on you know who actually does that for us and how often um have and i'm we've probably upped our obviously upped our um supplies or our reserves due to the accelerated cleaning and the frequency that we do that so i wouldn't mind a little bit more information on our suppliers you know and how we're doing that and if we have any trouble getting the uh supplies that we need or who kind of takes care of all that so i would just appreciate it can be a report on agenda or if we could all just get a little bit more information but i know people are wondering you know like oh could they get stuck without hand sanitizer could could they run out could they you know do they have enough masks to because you have to you know wear them um frequently and do we change them things like that so just 
a little bit of report on supplies and how we're going to do that in our new normal. Yes, board member. We'll provide that at the next meeting. Thank you. That was it. All right. Any other board members have any future agenda items? All right. Hearing none, then I adjourn this meeting at 8.04 p.m. Our next board Hi, meeting, Our next board meeting will be Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. Have a great evening, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, board members. Thank you, community. Have a great night.